Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, if you would, please. Book of Matthew, chapter 7. Uh, we're looking forward to chapels this semester. A week from Friday, we're doing our prayer chapel, the first Friday night. Uh, well, the first ever prayer chapel, maybe, quite like that, and we're excited about that. Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew, chapter 7. Praise God. Praise God. Have you been in class today? You had class today, right? You started class yesterday? Amen, you look classy. The humor did not get any better over the break. I'm just going to tell you right now. But uh, I believe the Lord has something to share and speak to you today. Matthew chapter 7. If you would stand together with me, it's just good for you. If I was you, I'd want to stand up. I'd been sitting all day. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. I'm on a Are they teasing me, or can I use this? Thank you, Samson. You're a good man. I'll give you that one. That's wonderful. Is it working now? Matthew chapter 7? I'll go fast. Apparently the batteries don't last long on these. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Are you there? All right. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, Acts. Somebody shout Acts. God likes it when his people do something. How many want to do something for the Lord? You know, the Bible has actually a book named Acts. Did you know that? Yeah, so he wants us to do something. I can't wait to do something. And Acts on them may be compared to, all right, let's see who we're, who we're compared to, a wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house. Wow. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the same rain descended and floods came and the wind blew and burst against that house. And it fell. And great was its fall. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. I want to talk to you this morning on what is versus what will be. What is versus what will be. Jesus, please speak to every person here today. We would, Holy Spirit, hear something from you and let it not get just in our head, but get in our spirit so we'll never forget it. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you for standing for God's word. As one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is like, not like the other. There are two differences in this text. One is we have a person who's wise. The other difference is that we have someone who's foolish. Am I going too fast for you? There are similarities, though, in the story. The similarities are that we have both people are men. The similarities are both men have houses. The similarities are that both houses go through storms. Hey, you guys are engaged? I'm looking at the Phillips. Yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, congratulations. When are you going to get married? What's that? This summer. Oh, okay. Congratulations. Anyways, um, they both face storms. The wise and the foolish had access to the same information, the same weather app. They both heard the same thing. I, I, I don't think anybody here today says, I want to be trained to be foolish. Right? Nobody here wants to be trained to be foolish. But to be foolish doesn't mean you're ignorant. Ignorance and foolishness are different. Ignorance is you don't know. Foolishness is you know, and you walk away from it. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. Sometimes, but not always, are foolish people easy to spot. There are people here that it won't take you long once you get into the semester to find out they're foolish. It doesn't take me long through chapel to already find out some of that. <laughs> so they don't always wear a sign because a foolish person can be smart, 
fun, nice. They can have money. They get promoted. How many have ever worked with a foolish person? A fool can be famous. They can get married. Fools have kids. They can go to Bible college. They pastor churches. Hello? How many glad I'm not talking about you today? I'm just talking about fools, right? So it's just, you got to break down the image in your mind of what you think the fool in that scripture looks like. Because that fool could be walking right down the street with a wise man and you not know the difference between the two. See, the Bible says a fool is someone who despises instruction. That's why I don't think you, most of you are fools. A fool likes correction. A fool wants to be told something that's uncomfortable now to save them pain later. A wise person says, tell me what I need to hear because even if it causes me temporary discomfort, I know it's for a long-term gain. I'd rather suffer a little now. I, it's amazing, and I don't know what everybody's background is, but it's amazing how many times in the old life you would hear guys say, I'm going to get tie one on, or I'm going to get hammered this weekend, and I know I'm going to have to sleep till noon on Sunday, but, but I know I'm, I'm just going to do it. The, the thing with sinners is they're willing to go through, they're willing to have a little pleasure expecting the pain, and too many Christians won't take a little pain expecting the pleasure. And so what I'm encouraging you here today is to find a way to make sure that you learn to lead in what is and what will be. A foolish person, I'm going to get to the good in a minute, just trying to help you to know it when you see one. A foolish leader thinks they're okay because things are good. A foolish leader thinks things are okay because things are good. Got a little money, some things, some progress. But you just can't really tell yet if that's a foolish leader or a wise leader. Time will tell. See, the greatness, the greatest weakness of a fool is they don't know that they've been fooled. Right? Isn't that what makes a blind spot a blind spot? You can't see that you don't have it. Right, So here's the issue. Fools love their family. They take care of their kids. They go to dinner. They sometimes are good citizens. They volunteer. And actually, they're smart enough to know how to build a house. And sometimes fools are smart enough to even build a ministry. And the problem is that fool leaders are the hardest to train because they don't think they need any training. Hello. You're so vain. You think this sermon's not about you. Nothing like a good just right, like slap fight sermon at the very first semester right here. First sermon of the semester. But we're getting somewhere. I'm trying to help you a little bit. Okay? Watch. Here's the problem. There, that, that sometimes people who have some abilities already can leave at the same level they came in because they don't see their need to be trained. Right? So the hardest people to lead to Christ are who? The people who've got a great family. They live a holy life, really. They're more moral. They live a moral life. Aren't they the hardest people to win to Christ? You find some dude down on the street, and he, he doesn't know where he's going to eat supper. He's going to sleep out in the cold tonight. He'll receive Jesus very easily. That's not a spiritual thing. It's human nature. And we have to be careful. I'm going to get there. I'm, I'm going somewhere better in a minute, but just walk with me. Where are you going to go? So, <laughs> so, uh, we have to be very aware that, that in each and every one of us, there is a fool and there is a wise person. And if we don't figure out how to crucify the fool and work on the wise, then when, not if, but when the storm comes, you'll become a statistic. It's my concern. I'm not really, I am concerned you pass your grades. I am concerned that you get through this successfully. But I'm more concerned that when we get to heaven, you have finished your race. You have fought your fight and you have successfully done it. Getting a bachelor's degree is not the end game. It is a doorway, but the end game is for you to be able to stand at the end and Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful and wise leader. 
See, what makes the, the, the issue is the foolish man didn't go into the storm because he's foolish, and the wise man didn't go into the storm, miss the storm because he's wise. Try it one more time. The foolish man is not in the storm because he's foolish, and the wise man does not miss the storm because he's wise. Jesus, somebody shout Jesus. I think it's a lot more important in the day that we live in now to start preaching the red letter stuff because I hear a lot of commentary and posts, but I want to know what Jesus said. And Jesus said, y'all going to have some storms. Now, he didn't say y'all, but it's in the Greek kind of that way. Use all. Storms. Somebody shout storms. Storms, storms are going to come. Jesus said it. Now, he didn't say it had to come in your house. For the foolish, when the storm comes, it gets into everything and messes it all up. For the wise, when the storm comes, they look out the window and say, hmm, I'm watching Netflix. Right? Everybody, everybody in this place, if you decide to go on into ministry, which I hope you do, the test is not whether you graduate. The test is whether you finish. Graduation, I know for some of you, I remember being a freshman sitting on the hardwood pews, single, hearing people talk about the rapture, every chapel, teasing me and making me think, I will never be married. Jesus is coming, and I'm going to be single forever. Lord, if you would, just hold off. Let me at least get a diploma. Let me please. I'd like, and in that meantime, I believe, Lord, you'll send me. Please, don't let, it was three, and I was married with, I think, within a year. So, um, yeah. So, but I remember thinking three years was like 30 years. Like, oh, I just got to get to graduation. I just got to get married. There's a lot of life beyond graduation. And there's a lot of life beyond the wedding day. Everybody, right, right? And, and what I'm trying to say is the fool and the wise can both graduate. And the fool and wise obviously do get married. Hopefully not the wise to the fool. But that's up to you. We're going to do our best to help you, but be careful. Here's my concern. is not that you graduate and get married. My concern is that the people that God saved you to get led to Christ, get led to Christ, and that your marriage is good and your kids serve God and you got a great reputation and you got one wife, the same one you graduated with or the one you married after you graduated. Hello? That's, that's the end game. That's the end game. But, but, but much of how that goes is determined on how this goes. So this is what messed me up this morning. I didn't know I was preaching this today until I read this this morning. Lean in and, and hear what I'm about to tell you. According to the Social Security Administration, if you take any 100 people at the start of their working careers, which is you, and follow them for the next 40 years until they reach retirement age, here's what you'll find. Remember, how many people? 100. For how many years? This is what will happen by the Social Security Administration says, one will be wealthy. Four will be financially secure. Five will continue working, not because they want to, but because they have to. 36 will be dead. And 54 will be broken, dependent on friends, family, relatives, and the government to take care of them. Monetarily speaking, that's only 5% of us who will be successful in creating a life of freedom and 95% who will, struggle to, to, who will continue to struggle their entire life. Hello. That is the product of a foolish nation. And why for the life of me, Christians continue to work hard to be like the world? It's like the world is, is, is 5 and 95. They've won 5 matches and they've lost 95. And we're so trying, busy trying to keep up with the world and have what the world has and be accepted by the world and be liked by the world and get likes on all of our social media posts when the world's house is burning. 
and we're like, how close can I build my house to the world so it too shall catch on fire? And I'll have somebody else to blame. Hello? Why is it that, <laughs> I would think we'd catch altitude here in a minute, but let me just keep following the Lord here. The crucial question is, at what point are God's leaders going to stop living at this level of the world's standards and start going to another standard and stop living like a fool and start living like the wise and say, I'm not trying to get through to the weekend. I'm trying to get through to eternity. I'm not trying to have my best life now. I'm trying to have the best eternity forever. I'm not trying to get you to look at me. I'm trying to get you to look at him. I'm not trying to be the most popular here. I'm trying to make him most popular out there. I'm not trying to see how much I can get. I'm trying to see how much I can give. It's time for God's people to rise up with some wise leadership and say there isn't a storm that is bigger than the God that is in us. So enough of this weak, sissified Christianity that just doesn't want to cause any problem. We are the storm. We are the strength. We are the lion of the tribe of Judah. Let's get up early. Let's go to bed late and let's work till Jesus comes. So the, the challenge is that fool, Matt Ward, and that wise Matt Ward, that fool Ken, and that wise Ken, that fool David, and that wise David. So here's the challenge. Because as, as much as you might think you're a fool and you can't be wise, or as much as you might think you're wise and you can't be a fool, scientists tell us you have both. You have two parts of your brain the strongest part is so weak, and the weakest part is so strong. Actually, the human brain, quite literally, by scientists' say statements, is the human brain is quite stupid. It's so stupid that it will allow you to smoke cigarettes knowing you're going to get lung cancer and say it's okay. It's so stupid to think that you're smarter than the guy that runs Hollywood slots, and when you go down to gamble, you're always going to win. <laughs> no, no. How, how many of you look at the stupidity that people do, and you say, how could they be so stupid? I'll tell you how they could be so stupid. Most of the physical brain is stupid. <laughs> I thought it was going to get better. Me too. <laughs> There's a part of your brain called the basal ganglia. It is the strongest part of your brain. And it usually gets what it wants long term. But what it wants is a short term satisfaction. It's from the basal ganglia that you hear the words say, but it's on sale. <laughs> it's the basal ganglia that says, we can afford this, we have checks. <laughs> it's the basal ganglia that says, go ahead, let your girlfriend cut your hair. It's the basal ganglia. That, it's the basal ganglia that works in the what is. But then there's the prefrontal cortex, which is really smart, but that's weakest part of your brain. The prefrontal cortex is located right behind your forehead, which is why we keep laying hands on your picket little head, hoping Jesus will get in there, and mine as well, right? Jesus, or what was I thinking? But it's the manager. The prefrontal cortex thinks about long-term effects. The basal ganglia thinks about what is now. So the basal ganglia is, it gangli, ganglia is manner. Ganglia is how it's stated, is what is. But the prefrontal cortex is what will be. And the fool works in the basal ganglia. But the Spirit of God wants to work in the prefrontal cortex. Dr. David Nowell, the psychologist, differentiates the differentiates the prefrontal cortex from the rest of the brain. He says that everything except the prefrontal cortex determines what is, and the prefrontal cortex focuses on what could be. Fear works in the what is. Faith works in the what will be. The flesh, the flesh works in what is. The spirit works in what will be. Depression finds its place in what is, but victory finds its place in what will be. Excuses are in what is, 
but revival is in what will be. Come on. And what I'm here to try to help you to do is to understand that the foolish man said, hey, this is an easy place. I like the beach. I'm looking at the water. The guy obviously knows how to build. He's smart enough to have a house, I mean to have a job. Apparently he needs a house for his family. So got, this guy's like functional, but he's doing what everybody else is doing. But when the storm comes, what he's doing won't last. And, and the reason that we have standards and we have requirements and we have expectations is not so that we can make life challenging for you. The reason you have those standards is so that when the storm comes 10 years from now and when the storm comes 20 years from now and when the storm comes in from the culture and the storm comes in from dead religion and the storm comes in from honorary church members, I'm going to tell you, you will not crumble like a foolish man. You will stand like a wise man and say, I have built on something that lasts. Come on, somebody shout, I will have victory. So if you're going to overcome what is, you're going to have to make up some, make some decisions. Number one, ready? Write them down, they'll be on the screen. Number one, to, to, to function in what is, you've got to strengthen your spiritual desire. Strengthen your spirit, increase your spiritual hunger. Well, I just don't feel. You've got to get that sanctified. Come on, how many know you need your emotions sanctified? I cannot live by my feelings. Psalm 1-1. Hey, you, you, you sit tight. I'll find it for you. Psalm 1-1. I'm messing with you. Psalm 1-1. I'm so happy to see you again. Did I say that earlier? Okay, now I'll preach. Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The Bible does not say that the blessing is on those who do the law of the Lord. The blessing is on those who delight in doing the law of the Lord. Why am I doing all these things that don't work? Because God loves a cheerful giver. God looks at the heart of the person. And when you decide, I'm going to feed my spirit man, you know what? It won't be hard to read your Bible. It won't be hard to worship. It won't be hard to fast. It won't be hard to witness. It won't be hard to study. You know why? Because my spirit man is not, dic- my spirit man is dictating what I'm doing, not my flesh. First Peter 2, desire the milk of the word of the Lord. Psalm says, as the deer pants for the waters. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. When somebody has to force you to read your Bible, your spiritual hunger is decreasing. Number two, rest in the yoke. Rest in the yoke. If I'm going to not be controlled by what is and make short-term decisions that have long-term consequences that are negative, I've got to learn to rest in Jesus. I'm told, I don't know, I don't have the count, but 1,700 pastors a month in the United States quit. That's what they say. I don't know if it's true. It seems hard to believe. Hello? That's why the quit rate in Bible college can't go up because the quit rate out there is too quick, too strong. Somebody's got to finish. Somebody's got to get the job done. And I don't believe that, that God is raising up this last generation of harvesters so that you can quit halfway through. God is going to raise you up so that when you get into it, you just keep going higher and higher. Come on, more vision, more dreams, more aspiration, more faith. I, you got to get around some folks that say, I'm not doing this for retirement. I'm doing this for eternity. <laughs> And the moment you begin, God helps some of you whose roommate's tired all the time. Ugh. Honestly, quite honestly, quite honestly, if I had a roommate that was tired all the time, what are my options, Brother Sutton? No, I don't. <laughs> Pray for him. Cast the devil out of him. If it's a guy, cast the woman out of him. <laughs> No, you're acting like a woman. Your mama, your mama had too much influence. Your daddy should just get you, slap you on the backside. Get up, get to work, son. The battle is going forward. And if it's your wife, you just need to say, "Oh God, dethrone the drama queen out of my room. Give me some victory in this house." I'm preaching the gospel. I think now. 
Come on, the joy of the Lord is my strength, and tiredness is, a, is worse than COVID. I'm so tired. I'm so, I'm so tired. You slept 10 hours. You're not tired. Your brain broke. Now, if you travel 24 hours like Steve, I mean, I, you, you can be tired. I mean, I, there's nothing sinful about, you know, putting in a hard day's work and waking up and saying, I need some coffee. I get it. I get that. But five days in a row, nine hours a night, sleep, three hours a day, Netflix, four hours a day, video games? Are you serious? No, no, are you kidding me? Here it comes. Here comes the storm. <laughs> Two, three hours of playing video games and you're tired? You're not tired. Your brain broke. God didn't build your brain to play video games and be somebody you're not. Be who you are. Be the person you want to be online in person. Give us some Fortnite fighters in Bible college, not on the screen. Give us some people who will be soldiers for the cross, not for Mario. That's all the video game illustrations I got because everything before that's Pac-Man. That's all I got after that. No, no, come on, I'm trying to shake you up. I'll, if I got to offend you, I'll offend you. But wake up, wake up. Time to shine, time to rise. You got a God that's for you. The devil's defeated, and you got a reason to be joyful. Come on, go on, just everybody, shake it off. Shake it off, shake it off. Right, you know that old hymn. All right. If I... I don't think this is legal, but I give you presidential permission. If you're in the room with a tired roommate, I dare you to get that old gospel hymn, shake it off, and play it as loud as possible every single morning on YouTube. Shake it off. Shake. Well, okay, anyways, I'll leave it alone. Leave it alone. God's trying to tell me to behave. You know it's true. Come on, I'm looking at you. A third of you were like, you've been here two days. You came tired. You came weary. Maybe you came from a depressed home. Maybe your church is defeated. Maybe you had some upsets. Maybe you had some disappointments. But you're on sacred ground today. You're in the presence of God, and we're for you. We're not against you. We're going to the end together in victory. You know, the Lord is marvelously removing all the words of that song out of my brain right now because I'd start singing it. And it's probably 10 years old, so. You, you, got to, you got to rest in the yoke. Elijah faced Jezebel, and he was weary from the battle. He laid down to take a nap, a siesta. And, and he wakes up. Can you imagine if you're in your dorm room tomorrow morning, whatever time, and you wake up and you look over, and there's this eight-foot-tall angel, great big wings, arms like, Stone Cold Steve Austin. And he's got an apron on. And he's cooking pancakes and bacon and sausage and fresh squeezed orange juice. And, and, he, and, he's, got, and he's got all this cooking. And you have a bite of it, and then you just go back to sleep. If I was your roommate, I'd hope you would. It's all over here, angel. Cook it for me. You know what Elijah did? He ate it and went back to sleep. I mean, oh, you're bone tired. He played too many video games when he was running from Jezebel. That was his escape. Hello? Watch this. Watch this. I feel like I'm in a groove here this morning all of a sudden. I feel like maybe the Lord's using me, but, you know, I just, Luke, I need you to know not everything I say is from God. Are you okay with that? Okay. You know, the Apostle Paul said, these are the things from God. And now Paul's like, but if I was you, I would do this. <laughs> right? So the whole video game, that was Matt. And shake it off, definitely Matt. <laughs> All right? Are we okay with it? At least I can admit it. All right? It's okay if you can just admit when it is God and admit okay, when it's not. But Elijah went back to sleep. I'm just telling you, you can just rest. When it starts getting heavy, look, look I promise you right now, this school is not built for you to be able to do it without Jesus. It is intentionally and uh, 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 methodolo methodolo it's intentionally 
designed for you to never be able to do it in yourself. And the only way some of us can know that we don't have to do it in ourselves is when we get to the point where we can't do it in ourselves. But I got good news. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. But you've got to bow your head and get up under the yoke of Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm tired. I can't sleep. I'm not doing well. I must be trying to do this on my own. I've got to get up and I've got to start leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. Jesus, I need your yoke because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Number three, build your faith, not fear. Build your faith, not fear. Build your faith, not fear. The rains came. The rains came. The rains came. There's like a season that, that is an attack on a ministry or a man or a woman of God, and the rains come, and, and we have a season. It just seems like everything gets dampened. And, and sometimes you can just feel that in a class. You can feel that in a dorm. You can feel that in a cafeteria. You can feel that in a church. It just feels like the rain has come. And then after the rains come, the flood. The flood is when you got too much rain for one moment. A flood happens when what is there to contain the rain can't contain it. So now it, you got too much coming at one time. And then the wind blows. It's like it's out of control. I don't know where it's coming from. So it's like I'm in a season. I feel this dampness, and then I can't take all of the different things that are coming at you. You got you got ministry here, and you got class over there, and you got work study over there, and you got relationship over here, and you and 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 and, and all of this stuff. And you you, you just, it's like it's too much. And then the wind comes. You're like I don't know where it's coming from next. I don't know where it's coming from next. But I'm going to tell you something. You have built your house on the rock, Jesus Christ, and the rain will not move the rock. The floods will not move the rock. The wind will not blow the rock. And if you will stand in Christ, you will outlast. Ask the storm. Come on, somebody thank God for the rock, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Number four, quit quitting. Quit quitting. What do they call that clause when two people that have money get married? None of you need to worry about it right now. A prenup. <laughs> A prenup. Like if we get divorced, you get my shirt. You don't need one. But a prenup is kind of like, I'm not taking quitting off the table. Right? Well, I'll go back one more semester, and I don't know. It's, it's not about that semester. It's about that mentality. And if you, quit, if you quit quitting in life, you won't have to worry about quitting. <laughs> I would go in every dictionary I owned. Of course, yours are all digital. And I'd take a black Sharpie and I would mark out quit. I would highlight quit with a black Sharpie. Because I quit quitting. We should have a small group for quitters. It's 12 years long. <laughs> no, we should have a small group for quitters. Say, hi, my name is Matt. I quit. I quit everything I do. As soon as it gets hard, I quit. As long as it's not fit my schedule, I quit. As soon as I get tired, I quit. As soon as I don't have enough time to play Fortnite, I quit. I quit. No, no. Quit quitting. Because if you quit this, it's easy to quit that. But if you stand strong in this, when it comes time to quit something more important, you won't quit that. <sighs> quit quitting. You got you to gotta, you gotta stand. I got to get done. You got to stand because an unclean spirit will always come back. An unclean spirit will always, I, I said this Sunday, and, and, and maybe it will ring true. You remember the man of the Gadarenes, right? Remember when Jesus took his disciples to this little mission trip, and they went to a cemetery? I wonder what Jesus was trying to teach those guys, that, by the way. Hey, guys, we're going, imagine if Dr. Bell took all of you on a trip. Where are we going? Mount Hope Cemetery, <laughs> where Stephen King shot Pet Cemetery. What time? Midnight. And then we dressed up Big John here like a, like a ghoul or a zombie, and he come running out and say, okay, all you worshipers, what are you going to do with him now? Jesus takes these guys to like this Friday the 13th, Friday night horror show, and out comes the man, and he's got a reputation. They chained him. They wanted to chain him up, and he broke the chains. And, you know, he had more than one set of chains. He kept breaking chains. Where did he get his chains? Did he go to Tractor Supply? The cemetery version of it? Where did he get his chains? 
Can somebody tell me where he got his chains? People brought him the chains. You got to get everybody that gives you the chains to quit out. Unfriend, delete, bye bye, sayonara, hasta la taco, baby. You just got to make up your mind. Because that spirit wants to come back and get you to quit over and over. And you need somebody to pick you up by the collar and say, you ain't quitting. You got too much to fight for. You've come through too much. You got too much to go to. Fight, fight, fight. Discouragement is the soil that the seed of quitting grows in. 